Israel M. Mechanum was the most prolific printmaker in Europe during the 15th century, the first to really use his identity as a brand on his prints. And the paradox is he copied almost everything from other artists. They started to investigate what was the copy culture prior to the emergence of print technology. And the reality is that for centuries and centuries, everything had to be copied. If you wanted a book copy, you had to do it by hand. If you wanted that image repeated, you had to copy it. And also pedagogically, as an apprentice in a workshop, okay, copy this work by the master, learn to draw. So I wanted to investigate how copy culture meets this ability to replicate images, distribute images, market images, and then what happens to change culture, to create concepts about authenticity, originality, what's a copy, what isn't a copy, what's okay to copy, what's not okay. Welcome to Plate Mark. This is series three in which Ben Levy and I are interviewing the many colorful characters that make up the print ecosystem. It's acting like an archive of sorts. We felt like there were many voices that needed to be heard and get down on tape. So we're doing it. We're gonna interview curators and artists, print shop owners, master printers, gallerists, dealers, you name it, we're gonna do it. Today, we have an interview with James Wen. He is the Van Vleck Curator of Prints, Drawings and Photographs at the Chazen Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Ben and I were in Madison in March, 2022 to interview Paula Penchenko and her husband, Russell Penchenko, as a part of the programming of the Southern Graphics Council International's conference. We had the opportunity to sit down not only with Paula and Russell, but also with James and also the master printers at Tandem Press. I hope you enjoy the conversation. It's always fascinating to talk to another curator for me. James is a wonderful curator and has deep an abiding interest in early German prints. His dissertation was on Israel van Mechenem. But as happens in museum collections, especially if there's a large print collection, one becomes a real generalist. So let's see what he has to say. Buckle up, here we go. It has struck me working on the exhibition Pressing Innovation, Printing Fine Art in the Upper Midwest and also just being at the Southern Graphics Council International Conference, just how important relationships are. So much is accomplished and learned through relationships and printmaking seems to be an art that really fosters collaboration and a transfer of knowledge, technical skills. What is this medium? How do you achieve this particular aesthetic effect? How do you do this? And that is something I've really observed is true of, of printmaking. I always liken the print council of which you're a member and I was before I stepped out. The print curators all know each other where there's no painting group equivalent mm. of curators. So it's, it, I knew that I could call you at the Chazen and say, Hey, do you have an impression of whatever? And it was a, just a much more collegial, I don't know. I just think it works better. Do you think some of it might be the multiplicity of prints and that I might have an impression in my collection here at the Chazen, you might have one in Baltimore, Cleveland has one, you know, and that fosters some connection as well. Well, for sure. Yeah. We can speak the same language about the same images, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's true historically. There, there's also that network you're talking about with people. I could own something and I could be attracted to a work of art for one reason. And so could you for a completely different reason. And then there's this wonderful unseen network of we're drawn to the same thing and it's not it's not that that notion of like well i have it and the fact that i have it means that you don't have it you know mm -hmm. that, that that notion is completely broken that we could all have things and museums can have things all across the world all for various reasons and if we all pull that that psychic energy and that that all of those reasons for liking something together what a rich experience of one shared thing could be. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it just struck me while you were talking, Ben, that it's not just that we all might have knowledge of these multiples in different collections or different locations, but then it becomes also about the differences between them. Like this impression was printed at this time by this master printer 
This one is from outside that edition. It was printed the next year for an expo, you know, things like that, that really are part of understanding the history of that object and that uh, matrix and that image, I think makes it super, super fascinating. Well, and it's so well suited to people who love details. <laughs> right. <laughs> you yeah. gotta keep track of all those extra printings. <laughs> right. You know, I gotta write everything down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will you, for our audience, tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about you and what you're doing here? Yeah, my name is James Wen. I'm the Van Vliet Curator of Works on Paper at the Chasing Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm responsible for prints, drawings, photographs, and anything that's on a paper support for any region, all time periods. So no, no biggie. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> I've definitely been learning to become a generalist in some some sense of word. Do you all have an active study room situation with the students? We do. Yeah, we have a very active study room. We like to say that the Chazen is the university's largest arts classroom and the study room for prints, drawings, and photographs is a big part of that. We serve art students, studio artists, the art history department, language students that are coming from English lit, sometimes German language speaking classes, uh, a number of different groups use it. The the prints, drawings, and photographs collections. How does it work with, if a professor says, Dr. Wynn, can I see all of your Picassos from 19 whatever? Do you talk to the class about it or does the professor need to be prepared? It depends on the situation. We have a study room assistant, a student employed to help manage the study room. So they field inquiries through a study room email. That professor might know exactly what objects they want to see and show their class, and they might have a lesson plan that they want to use with those objects. That student assistant might help them create a list uh, based on their interests, navigating what, what's available, maybe on the themes that they're interested in. And sometimes professors do ask for a curatorial presence, uh, like me, uh, to come into the room and talk about watercolors or German expressionist prints, for example. When I'm available, then I will certainly join the class. And that's really interesting for me because at the Chazen, when we're looking to acquire new works of art, we want to acquire good things for the collection as a museum, but we also want to acquire things that we know will be useful in classes because our, our mission is to first and foremost support the students and faculty of the university. That was the thing when we were proposing acquisitions in Baltimore, inevitably when you were in front of the committee of mostly trustees and collectors, that there would be somebody who'd say, well, why should we get that if it's just going to sit in a drawer? And I'd roll out the speech about being useful and mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it never fails. I love listening to faculty teach from objects because they bring in these perspectives that I might not have ever considered different points from the histories that they're relevant within or the contexts. And so participating in a class really helps me to understand how the objects might be useful. Yeah. You must have a mental, you probably have one written down now, knowing you of, of the top five things that you lack in the collection that would be awesome. Like you don't have all four disgracers or something. We do have all four disgracers. <laughs> five <of them>. <laughs> <laughs> From the history of print, we can pretty much steps through the history of European and American printmaking. We have objects that represent important developmental moments. We're strongest in contemporary work, in part because we have the Tandem Archive and they work with phenomenal contemporary artists. And every time they addition a print, the archive impression comes to the Chazen, which I love. We have also a number of smaller collections that have been given to the museum over the years. For example, and I was just looking at prints from the Mark and Helen Cooper collection. They were Wisconsin collectors in the, I guess, 60s, 70s. And they gave their collection of prints to the Chazen. And it is really heavy in Atelier 17. So they were acquiring prints by Hayter, Gail Singer, George Ball, right in the moment that they were being created. And so, so that is a strength that we have this nice group of of prints from Atelier 17. I was just looking through them with Ron Rumford, actually, who's in town for the conference. Listeners will know that Ben and I did a lot of research on theater and have no, no lack of love for Atelier 17 things. So you're, you're singing our song. 
I thought I might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, and going back a ways, one of the things that we definitely talk about a lot is in these different roles within the print ecosystem that sometimes different roles are kind of talk to each other, curators and dealers and collectors, but you know, the makers and the curators don't necessarily interact as much as one would assume mm -hmm. they do. And so I was curious if you might bring us back a little bit to how you wound up in print, how you wound up in curatorial. Sure. Yeah. I actually have a bachelor of fine arts degree in theater, which I got at Webster university in St. Louis and then moved to Minneapolis and worked for a couple of years performing at the children's theater company. After that job finished, I was still performing essentially a freelance performer, but I had to have a day job. So I ended up as a temp working for what at the time was American express financial advisors did well was hired to be an administrative assistant, became an analyst, eventually became a director at a staff of eight working in technology and finance and suddenly realized I'm working for a, what's basically a credit card company and a financial institution that I never really planned to have this career. And I had the means to travel, to go to museums. I found I was taking a lot of photographs in art museums and I thought, you know, I really like how things are installed in a gallery. I'd like to do that. Now I have all this project management experience. I think I could probably get a job doing this. How complicated can it be? <laughs> <laughs> so I started investigating what jobs were available at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And there were some available, but it clearly stated I needed a master's degree in art history. At least. At least right. or a PhD. And so I. Um, took some evening seminars at the University of St. Thomas just to see if I would like art history. And the first course I took, and I wasn't even seeking a degree at this point. And not in prints. Not in prints. Oh. I signed up for Northern Renaissance and Baroque art because I had seen, you know, some Van Eyck paintings and I kind of liked those and Bosch. Why thought, not? Yeah. It right. <laughs> seems really good. Yeah, cool. Interesting. And um, one of the assignments was to create a, a theoretical exhibition using prints by Ulrich Durer and uh, Rembrandt Van Rijn. And I didn't even know that this was a thing, right? I didn't even really know that prints existed. No one ever said, to come up and see my etching? <laughs> no, no, I grew up in Northern Wisconsin. I don't think there were any etchings there. Not that I knew of anyway. But I was thrilled because this was exactly what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to install things in galleries. And so to have a opportunity to practice this with a theoretical exhibition was exactly what I thought would be uh, perfect for me. That's where I learned about prints. And then we were using prints from the Thrivent Financial Collection of Religious Art. The curator there, Joanna Ryland Lindell, then invited me to have an internship. So I was really able to work for the first time with a collection of prints and they, they got have really really strong yeah. in Durer and Rembrandt, which is why the theoretical exhibition was right. kind of based on that, that group. And then Tom Rasher came to be the head of prints and drawings at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. He paid a visit to Thrivent to look at the Rembrandts. He's a Rembrandt print specialist. And that was like the first time I really got to look at Rembrandt prints with a Rembrandt print scholar, curator, expert. And this was all still were you, were you seeking a degree at that? Yeah. Point? By that time, I think I had decided to leave American Express and pursue the master's degree at the University of St. Thomas and finished my degree. Tom had invited me to be a guest curator for an exhibition at the Institute of Arts and suggested because there was a large exhibition of Titian paintings coming from the National Gallery of Scotland that they wanted to have a Venice on paper exhibition that would be in you know, conversation with the paintings. And so I got to work on that drawing from the Minneapolis uh, collection. Because they uh, also have a substantial collection. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Really wonderful collection. And so that was my first opportunity to create an exhibition with Tom's mentorship for an important regional museum. And then I, I was hoping I might get a job there. <laughs> and uh, Tom said, you know, you really should try to go to the East Coast and work in East Coast museums. I think you'd really benefit from that experience. And so he recommended me for the fellowship at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in prints and drawings and photographs there. So I spent two years as the Margaret Mainwaring 
curatorial fellow. And then pretty much realized that if I wanted to land the sorts of curatorial jobs that I thought I wanted, that a PhD would probably benefit me. Because I came to art history kind of from a roundabout way, I felt that I really needed more training in uh, kind of academic art history. And then I was accepted into the Case Western Reserve Joint Doctoral Program with the Cleveland Museum of Art. And that afforded me an internship at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I was a uh, Mellon Fellow and had a pre-doctoral fellowship then at the Cleveland Museum of Art as well, and got to uh, work on several exhibitions there. And fortunately, uh, I think that experience combined with the degree helped me get the job here at the Chazen Museum of Art. So I graduated in 2019 in May, and I already had the job here and moved to start um, in Madison in June of 2019. So you're pretty fresh here. Yeah, still, yeah. yeah, especially because I worked about nine months and we went into lockdown because of COVID-19. And now we're back in the office and open, but it is, yeah, it still feels pretty new. What was the first project you did here? The first project I did was a rotation of prints on one of the mezzanines where we have some gallery space that we frequently rotate works on, works on paper. And while I was at Cleveland, I had the opportunity to acquire a Gale Singer print. Cleveland Museum of Art had no prints by Gale Singer, but this uh, print was at the Cleveland Print Fair, acquired it from Dolan Maxwell for the Cleveland Museum of Art. And I started going through the collection here, trying to figure out, you know, what was in the Chasen's collection. And I came across seven Gale Singers. I was like, wait, I know who this is. And why do we have so many here in Madison? And that's how I came to understand a little bit about the history of the Hooper collection. But the first thing I did, some of them had never been mounted, a folder of, of works on paper. Bazillions of those at the Baltimore Museum, still in folders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still here too. But I said, let's get these matted up and let's put them up. And so I did. It's fun. Yeah. We did a lot of acquiring towards a hater project, mm -hmm. mostly a hater, but other artists also, because we did have some pretty big gaps to fill, like Lazansky and you mm -hmm. know, things like that. Yeah, we, we're a little weak in Lazansky here, yeah. I have to say. I'm trying to close that right. gap. But we had no Gail Singers. Mm. Amazing. She's a phenomenal colorist. Yeah. Um, just really embraces bright yellow with lime green and purple, red on red on red. Yeah, it's quite <laughs> interesting. That's cool. Yeah. But your, your true love is Israel, the mechanism, right? Yeah, well, I, I kind of started learning the history of prints and uh, got stuck in you stopped right away <laughs> i know right i got stuck in the late 15th century <laughs> i did defect my dissertation on uh, israel von mechanum yeah well when was the what was the first experience you had with him well it would have been at the thriving collection oh it wasn't uh, in class or something it was no no i, I was already familiar with him because okay. the thriving financial collection of religious art had several shown gowers and and israel von mechanum's Daniel Hopfer, already I knew about him. And of course, Oliver Duber. What was it about? Yeah, why well, Mechanem is not showed well, ever. That really came out during the time that I was um, prepping for my qualifying exams. And I was reading, because I, so my major exam was in, I like to joke, it's in flat German art of the <laughs> 15th and 16th century. So not sculpture, but paintings, drawings, and prints of German speaking lands. And then my minor was prints from the same period, Italian and Netherlandish. So I got to have a pretty good scope of... Those are the major centers, those right? The major centers yeah. for printmaking yeah. in, the, in the 15th and 16th century. France was kind of excluded in that. But I don't know, it just kind of came out in the conversations I was having with my advisor, Catherine Scalland. I think I was complaining that I felt like Israel and Mechanum was getting a bad rap <laughs> because he's the first, well, he was the most prolific printmaker in Europe during the 15th century, probably the first to sign his name on the print and well, and certainly the first to really use his name, his identity as a brand on his prints. And the paradox is he copied almost everything that he printed from other artists or he would find elements in broadsides, and he would copy those into an engraving. Maybe we could say that he's upscaling it from a sort of, you know, mediocre woodcut and a broadside to a like 
pretty luxe engraving, but he copied everything. And so there's this inherent paradox. Here we have someone who's signing their name, which we, I think in modern times think that that's the author, right? Of the image. And yet he wasn't really the author of the image. So I started to really investigate that and tried to understand, well, what was the copy culture prior to the emergence of print technology, which allowed the multiplication of images. And the reality is that for centuries and centuries, everything had to be copied. If you wanted a, a book copy, you had to do it by hand. If you wanted another, that image repeated, you had to copy it. And so, and also pedagogically as an apprentice in a workshop, okay, copy this, learn to draw, copy this work by the master. And then just the workshop model required a lot of copying. And we know that you know, transferring and drawing to a plate involves, you know, some degree of drawing and copying and tracing or however that might happen to get that matrix going. So I wanted to just really investigate how copy culture meets this ability to replicate images, distribute images, market images with a, a brand like Ezra Lam Mecknam, AD for Albrecht Durer. And then what happens to change culture? to create concepts about authenticity, originality, what's a copy, what isn't a copy, what's okay to copy, what's not okay. And we know from, you know, cases with Albert Durer, he detested copyists. I had there at least one lawsuit known and documented in Nuremberg, another one recounted by Vasari in, in uh, Venice. But in both those cases, the artist who was copying Albrecht Durer's prints and signing them AD was told, well, you can copy them. You just can't put AD. So what, what that tells us is it was really the labor and the materials that were valued and not the intellectual capital of the image, the creation of that uh, image was not valued as highly. So in the North though, the Italians were more interested in named artists. Don't you think? I think, I think that that was probably true. Yeah. They were more interested in named artists. But there was a lot of copying sure. in Italy as well. Yeah. I mean, Michelangelo, I, I don't think anyone knows of a print that he made. And yet many, many, many prints were made copying his work. I don't know that he cared. I would think it would be the notion of, hey, it's going to get my design, my design out there, right? Or no? Well, that's certainly what Raphael right. wanted to do right. in collaborating with Marc Antonio Raimondi. Right. Um, I think it's murkier with Michelangelo. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. On that point, we also have talked previously about the, the nature of the education versus the nature of the jobs and how that's oftentimes a, a major moment of transition for an individual for, for, for you or I. And so what was it like the thing before this was a dissertation, you know, a, a incredibly lengthy deep dive into one very particular thing. And suddenly you now are dealing with contemporary photographs, you're dealing with, you know, UKOA would go on put prints, you know, you're dealing with this whole scope. How, how was that for you? It's been good. It's been interesting. I've learned a lot, but it, it has been a challenge because I, I'm not able to investigate as deeply the objects that, that I come across for rotation. I kind of love skipping around because you could deep dive for kind of, sort of, yeah. but then you could move on. Yeah, that's true. I always <laughs> joke, like my favorite people sometimes ask me, well, what's your favorite print? And I always joke, it's the last one I was researching. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Do you, yeah. I, when I worked at the National Gallery, I had one specific John Ruskin watercolor that was my retirement gift. And, you know, my mom, mm -hmm. right. That was the thing I'm going to take. Did, have you found your retirement gift yet? Hmm. Well, I think that Albert Durer's nemesis might be oh, worth grabbing. That is some impression you guys have. Um, where did, the, you, where did it come from? That was acquired around the time that the LVM Art Center was being developed. Oh, so in the early, early. 60s. Wow. And, yeah. It's something. In anticipation of the opening of the museum. But it belongs, you know, it belongs in the museum, not, not in my apartment. Well, there is that. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I have a small collection of prints. I used to, you know, fancy myself a little bit of a print collector. But I soon realized the more I knew about prints, the less... I could afford. So, <laughs> so I sort of stopped at some point. Were you doing the early mm -hmm. mechanism sort well, of things? No, no, I don't have anything quite that early. 
But I've stopped and I, now I'm starting to think about, well, this would probably be good in a museum. I used to think then, now I'm not sure. About the <laughs> earliest thing I have right now, I think, are a couple impressions of Hans Burkmeier's etching Mercury, Venus, and Cupid, because I did a deep research project on that. And I would find them on the market and they might have a watermark that I wanted to see. And I didn't want them to disappear into the world where I wouldn't know where they were. So I had a couple. So it just, <laughs> it isn't that what other art historian could, could have that same kind of research experience, you know, if you're dealing with, you're not going to get a fresco on eBay. Right. That's true. That's true. Well, that's true. I'm not. There was another interesting thing about prints is how they can have meaning for individuals and they are more affordable in some cases for, for people to have. Well, I'm, I'm curious to start, circle back again. And when you were, when you were first realizing that in your travels that you were, you were starting to notice how things were installed, mm -hmm. maybe this is just speaking for myself, but like literally until I met Ann, I, I, I never really thought too much about how the art got on the wall mm. or in what. Much less who wrote this thing. Yeah, much less who wrote any of the, the labels or anything. Did you always know that that job existed? Well, I think it occurred to me because I was going to a lot of art museums for the first time in my life. And I was really interested in how a sculpture interacted with the painting that was nearby. You were a natural born how, curator. Or how a sculpt, you know, or perhaps like how a sculpture was framed by the architecture of the gallery. But that's then how I knew I had to, you know, pursue yeah. art history because there, there were, you know, relationships that had context. I am, I, we've done our origin stories already, but I had an internship at the Whitney in, during college and, you know, day two, I'm sitting in Barbara Haskell's office and I was like, this is it. Mm. And I never looked back. Nice. Until now, of course, I'm doing other things. But <laughs> I mean, I never really, it was like realized that that was an actual job that people could really, you know, work with the artist's estate and put the things on the whole and the show looks great and the catalog's beautiful. Yeah. Like, this is what I want. It feels good, doesn't it? When, yeah. when everything one has been planning is actually physically installed, one can see how it looks. It's the best. I think the best is creeping visitors in the gallery. I like to go in and pretend to be a visitor and see if I can, well, and notice what people are looking at. And then also see if I can overhear what people are saying about the art. I love that. Yeah. Are there any, any that you specifically recall any co overheard conversations that, that stayed with you? Yeah. There's one that I, I love because it was when I was doing the Venice on paper exhibition, there was a print by Otto Bacher of sailboats in, in Venice. And Tom would look through my proposed checklist and he, he let me ultimately make the decision, but he looked at this one and he said, you know, I don't know, you could probably cut this one from, from the show. Cause I mean, it's amongst some beautiful whistlers and Audubacher and Whistler were together in Venice. So I had some, you know, historical context, but maybe not the, the finest print in the show, but on the last day of the exhibition, a woman was looking at the show with her son and she told her son that this is my favorite one and i loved that mm -hmm. because i thought i felt a little validated yeah like then it says a lagoon around it there's a lot of sailboats this is the only one that really shows us those sailboats so why not include it and it ended up being someone's favorite so i that's why i like hearing how people respond and i'm regularly surprised what people gravitate to or really stare at might not be the thing I would pick, but that's the great thing about art is it offers everyone an opportunity to look and have an experience. Whereas we'd like to tell artists, you can't control what people are going to no. love about your work or not, love, you know? Yeah. yeah. Everybody has their own agency. Yeah. Yeah. Sh should somebody want to get in touch with you or follow you on, are you active on the Instas? I have been active on Instagram and Facebook. Works on paper Wednesdays. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done a post. We've been missing. Yeah. So our media specialist here at the Chase and we're getting a new one. And so, I, and I had gone on a hiatus because of the exhibition catalog I was writing. So it might come back. They were fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, works on paper Wednesdays. So there's still some posts out there one could find. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And a nice variety. But you can also, I think, 
Oh, was it hashtag for some paper Wednesday? Yeah, probably. Yeah. When, yeah, when, W-E-H-N. Yeah, like and the pun on my name. Right, exactly. Right, and I resisted that for a long time. Oh, that was free. Yeah, it was the editor's idea, and I was like, yeah, and, I, was and then, yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's catchy. It's our job and our desire to make things accessible, and, you know, however we get to do that, let's do it. Let me see. I'm going to give you the proper handle. Yeah. James Wen, and the hashtag is, oh, it's not worse on paper Wednesday. It's hashtag Van Vleck Curator. Oh, right. Yeah. Hashtag Van Vleck Curator. All right. We'll, we're going to, everyone's going to follow it now. I hope. Thank you for talking to us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been a joy. Likewise. Thank you so much for joining us for Plate Mark Series 3, an interview with James Wen, the Van Vleck Curator of Prince Drawings and Photographs at the Chazen Museum of Art. It was a joy to talk to him. I really appreciate his time. I always need to thank Ben Levy as my co-host. Um, the journey has been really fun, and I, I hope we get to do it for a long time to come. I also need to thank Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. Join us next time for an interview with some other luminary from the print ecosystem, and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>